had about uh, that time. Uh, who would you say was uh, one of the most gifted uh, engineers, in your opinion, if we had any there at Tectonics uh, with whom you were? Oh, I'd say John Kobe uh, was uh, uh, a very unique person. He had uh, the ability to solve problems uh, in a very direct, basic manner. And uh, he's a very sharp uh, guy. Dick Ropeke was another very sharp guy. Uh, well, why don't we, uh, Howard, comment on the uh, abilities, for instance, and the contributions of uh, uh, Logan Belvin early on. Well, Logan uh, designed the uh, 512, and he was involved in a number of uh, instruments. He was a uh, uh, very capable engineer, very, very methodical. Uh, I don't think he was uh, as uh, tuned in to people's problems as, as other, other engineers were tended to make what to him was the right thing, and uh, very often that was not what uh, people wanted. But uh, he's very good, a very good engineer. How about Dick Rieger? Well, Rieger was uh, he was uh, he did uh, design the uh, 517, and that was a, that was a terrific job. He's another very. Uh, uh, very confident, very methodical person, and uh, does a really good job on whatever he does. You've already mentioned Dick Ropke. Yeah, he's a, he's a he's a much more of an original thinker than either of the, the other two that we talked about, and he came up with. Uh, the really fundamental things, which were the basis of the patents. Cliff Moulton. Well, Cliff was another person who was very, uh, very good, very ingenious engineer. He solved uh, a lot of problems that didn't even exist. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> uh, he always. Uh, did a very, very, very thorough job, and he was very, very good at analyzing problems and seeing what the, what, uh, what should be done. Better at that than uh, thinking of new, new, new uh, solutions or meeting new needs. That's a very good. Uh, Bill Pollitz. Yeah, Bill. Uh, Did uh, work on uh, on uh, a number of uh, tech instruments. Very important to think it was uh, Pulitz that was concerned uh, with the development of the uh, uh, non-resonant probe cable, which was a very important. Uh, development plus any other day. There, were, there was a lot of team activity there. There were, there were uh, Kobe and Pulitz and Ropeke and worked together a lot and uh, it was very hard to tell who, who whose idea was what because they, they didn't uh, they weren't concerned with uh, whose idea it was. They just wanted to get the problem solved. And, I notice in the year 1956, it says the introduction of the Kobe Pulitz passive probe. Yeah. That was one of the most important things that we ever did because uh, prior to that time, 
there was uh, no practical way to get uh, signal into uh, a high-speed signal into an oscilloscope because if you used an ordinary piece of uh, coax, you got uh, big reflections from the open end, and uh, uh, the solution that 517 used was a was an active circuit on the input end, so that uh, you, you didn't have an unterminated cable. And that's a very nice uh, electrical solution, but it's not very uh, nice from a user standpoint. The, the probe is, at uh, that time, had a tube in and got pretty warm. And uh, the dynamic range was fairly small, and you had to put plug on attenuators on the front of the probe, and that was a yeah, big, clumsy thing to, to work with. Then when uh, Kobe Pulitz had the idea that if you made the center of the, the center wire of the coax a, a resistive wire of the proper resistivity, you could make a probe that was critically damped and all of these uh, uh, reflections canceled out. And uh, we did that. That was what made the 530, uh, the 540 oscilloscopes practical. Without that, I don't think they would have, it would have been a practical thing. And everybody then, yeah, uh, in the years past, uses that without any thought of how it, or where it came from. How it did. Although we had patents on that and we maintained them for a long time. Yes. We got royalties uh, uh, from that. We licensed a couple of companies to make probes that we didn't want to make. But that. This also shows 1956 the development of the distributed vertical amplifier. Kobe Pullets. Well, we had distributed amplifiers long before that. The 517, which was uh, must have been the third telescope we made that Rieger made when Mary Hawthorne had, had distributed amplifiers. Uh, Frank Hood's name has been mentioned yeah. a couple of times. What about Frank? Well, Frank was a, a very good engineer. And uh, he was really good at uh, packaging oscilloscopes uh, uh, in a uh, nice compact form. I think the 310 was, the, was probably the best example of that. Uh, Frank. Uh, of course, it was also very handy if you needed any photography done because uh, that was his hobby, which he turned into his business later on. Uh, <clears throat> how about John DeLorde? Well, John was uh, not an engineer. Uh, he's, uh, he was involved with uh, 